You know, I just bought 20 grand of Bitcoin. I'm speculating. I don't know what's going to happen to Bitcoin. Really, the only value in Bitcoin is someone else pays more for it than you do at some point in time. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today on the show, we're going to do some code cracking. Yes, sirree. We are going to master what I call the five properties in five different cities plan. Yes, real estate investment is a bit of a plan. What makes a lifetime property investor is all about setting some rules and expectations for yourself to make a plan. Tell you what, there's not too many people out there in society with five investment properties. So if you would like to join those people, today's episode is going to help crack that code, how to map it out, how to think it through, and how you can end up on passive investments. And yes, $3,000 a week. Yes, $3,000. Three grand in your hot little hand. Today's show really has a hidden agenda to put $3,000 a week in your back pocket. Now, who's pumped for New Year's Eve? I tell you what, I love New Year's. How good is it? It's always a bit of reverie, a bit of madness. Who's going to pash someone this New Year's Eve? I hope... uh, You've got someone in mind, you can do the 12 o'clock party kiss, nothing like it. And I tell you what, 2021 is going to be pretty awesome as well. We are expecting a bit of a bumpy year in property in just about all the cities around Australia. You can imagine we are almost being engineered to buy real estate. The Reserve Bank of both New Zealand and Australia is creating So many property investors, just about everyone in society, whether you're a retiree looking for income or whether you're a millennial looking for growth, the real estate market really does have a lot to offer. Now, I thought about today's show and quite often when you do a New Year's podcast, it's all about setting some New Year resolutions. And I tell you what, I wanted today's episode to be more powerful than setting a resolution to do the plank for 60 seconds. I think uh, we need some bigger goals than planking for 60 seconds. So this property plan is something which I've personally used. And I tell you what, it does allow you to end up asset rich, but also cash rich. Growing wealth from five properties is the quintessential backbone of this plan. Now, I want to explain to you how assets kind of work so you can really think through this plan and understand perhaps the rationale behind it. When I do my investing, I break up my assets into three sections. I have what I call my defensive assets, my backbone properties. And what I do is and have done and help people do is make sure the first cornerstone of investing is about growth. Growth, growth, growth. When growth happens in real estate, it can be short but very sharp. And so we want to make sure we have some really good growth assets. Our backbone in real estate, in my view, is to choose really good A-grade properties, which are going to always rent, always be the pick of the litter, whether they're houses or apartments. Location is a key metric. So you can imagine you're maybe starting out. Maybe you've got two properties. Maybe you've already got five properties and are in 1% of society that actually has achieved that. When you build a plan, you don't want to create a house of cards. So in my plan, it's very important to establish early on that we want really good assets. If that means taking a little bit more time to save a bigger deposit, 
then that's okay because better assets perform over the long term at a better rate. Real estate in all intensive purpose is really about the underlying asset. Is it a good location? Is it a good property that people will pay more for? So the cornerstone part of this plan to end up on $3,000 a week starts with understanding this plan is about building your five core assets. Once you have those five core assets, and I'm fast forwarding right now, you can look at two other types of asset classes. Dividend assets or real estate, which produces larger amounts of cash flow and speculation assets, things like shares or syndications or small armchair developing. What a lot of people do do and make the mistake of is buying often B or C or D grade real estate assets to build wealth. Those assets can quite often be dividend assets. And of course, those dividend assets don't grow as fast as your core assets will do. Remember, it's a lot easier to buy cash flow once you've got growth. So don't be in a hurry for cash flow positive real estate or don't be in a hurry for real estate that you're speculating in. That comes later. Give yourself time to build up quality real estate assets why? That will be the cornerstone and seed for the rest of your life. It will change your life. You just need one or two of those core assets that you first buy to perform, to double in value, and you can go straight out and do many other things. You can speculate. You can be an armchair developer. You can join syndications and do bigger and more bold investment strategies. You know, I always say my investment portfolio is backbone first and then absolutely cash flow and then absolutely speculation. You know, I just bought 20 grand of Bitcoin. I'm speculating. I don't know what's going to happen to Bitcoin. Really, the only value in Bitcoin is someone else pays more for it than you do at some point in time. Uh, there's no underlying asset value of Bitcoin. But for me, I'm able to speculate because I've gone to the trouble of building a backbone of real estate. So today's show is all about understanding we want to build the backbone of wealth. And that backbone, by the way, is pretty incredible. If all you got done was the backbone to wealth, you're going to be wealthy. You don't even need to speculate in joint ventures development or Bitcoin. And you don't even need to go out and add annuity or passive income streams to your wealth plan. The plan I'm going to give you today is bulletproof for growth, but will also put you on $3,000 a week. Now, a lot of people don't understand this. A lot of people really struggle when it comes to wealth building. And really, when we think about our New Year's resolutions, we don't have time to muck around. So one New Year's resolution I want you to make is to put this plan into action. You know, 82% of Australians and Kiwis don't have a wealth plan. Only 1% of Australian and Kiwis end up wealthy. 3% end up financially secure. And here's the real truth. Have you ever jumped in a taxi with a 65 or 75-year-old taxi driver? They are working to survive. The reality is most Australians and Kiwis do not live the latter part of their life with abundance. And it is a bit of a shame. You know, it's a real shame that people don't map this stuff out early. We know real estate is going to beat inflation. It's going to beat your savings and it will beat your superannuation. So to understand the cornerstone of this plan I'm trying to map out to you, you're going to need some money to get started. That could be saving from your wages. It could be from other investments which have already gone up. 
It could be from your house that you live in that has equity in it. It could actually be from handouts from government to get you started as a first home buyer, which we know are pretty prevalent at the moment. Remember, any surplus money you have right now that can form a deposit, that can buy assets, is money well spent. The reality is money in the bank is worthless. We've discussed that in the past. So we need to asset build. Will assets improve in value over time? Absolutely. We are seeing the time money conversation unfold where we know something that is going to be worth $500,000 today is absolutely going to be worth more into the future. So the pre frame of this conversation is you've got a little bit of equity you can put say 50 or a hundred thousand dollars into the market the real estate marketplace and work it so do you have a wealth system and this is a big question that i think a lot of people do not have do not actually have a plan i meet and talk to so many people so often about real estate. I don't think a day goes by without me speaking to maybe two or three people directly, belly to belly, about real estate. And the first real conversation I have is quite often about stuff, meaningless stuff. Oh, you know, the auction clearance rate or um, I've got a friend who... And I always link it back to them. Well, Tell me about your plan. What, what are you trying to achieve? What are your goals? What is your property investment plan? Do you have a roadmap? Do you actually follow a method? Do you have a system? And I am bemused that most people just throw a dart and high, try and hit the bullseye of the real estate market without a bit of a plan. I always then obviously offer people a bit of a plan and For me, this is as simple as real estate needs to be. What I'm going to lay out today is a tried and true plan and it is based around investing in our more safe marketplaces. So as you may have heard me describe before, Australia has a business plan. By 2051, Australia wants around 40 million people in its population. It's taken around 227 years for Australia to reach 25.5 million people, almost 26. And it's only going to take another short three decades for Australia to reach the milestone of 40 million people. So here's a lot we can learn out of that little statement. Already, You, if you invest today, are ahead of 14 more million people yet to be exposed to the real estate marketplace. Australia is not, you know, a country where people do not want to come to. Despite coronavirus impacting the next year or two, we are going to grow in size. And of course, many World famous companies are working on a coronavirus vaccine, which will be out no doubt next year. And all of a sudden, the world will start migrating and the flow of people will once again happen. But what that does lead us to is the five properties, five cities plan. In Australia, we have some big cities which we get the opportunity to invest in. I love big cities because big cities have big commerce. They have all sorts of jobs. You can have a downturn in one industry and those areas do not get affected because so many people work in them. By way of example, 51% of Queenslanders work in Brisbane. So if an industry is affected, the city just keeps rolling on. And we have to understand when we're building a property portfolio, we get often clickbaited. We get enticed into ideas. Let's go to a regional community. Let's go to a mining town. The enticement is out there. But what I can tell you is if you track the long-term performance of cities, they get the population, they get the infrastructure, 
they get the tax dollars, and they have the jobs. And more importantly, in a downturn, not too much happens that is really bad. However, in smaller areas, in a downturn, those areas can fundamentally be heavily impacted. I've seen areas in Australia that have dropped by 85% in value, which are what we call single market economies. So the backbone plan, remember this is our defensive asset plan. Before we go into a passive income plan or a speculation plan, we want a defensive asset plan. If nothing else works in our real estate world, at the very least, we want really good assets and really good growth locations. Australia has really five core cities, Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. All these cities have more than a million people in them. And by 2050, Sydney, for example, will have around 7.7 million people. Interesting, Melbourne will be bigger than Sydney at a projected around 8 million people. And Brisbane, which is a very focal market of 2021, is actually going to be the equivalent to what Sydney is today in size in about another 30 years' time. So this really does influence our decision-making. You know, I always say with real estate, start at the top and work your way down. The apex predator of Australian real estate is Sydney, then Melbourne, then Brisbane. That's how it works. It's like the biggest lion in the safari park is the Sydney property marketplace. If you can buy gun A-grade real estate in Sydney, you should. However, most people can't. So then they have to choose C or D-grade Sydney real estate. However, there is a more logical argument, why not upgrade to A or B-grade Melbourne real estate? Or if you can't afford A or B-grade Melbourne real estate, why not upgrade to A grade Brisbane real estate. See, at the end of the day, location and money kind of works the same way. People in A grade Brisbane locations earn kind of the same amount as A grade Sydney locations. So at some point, you're going to find that having the best possible assets in a city is going to perform for you. Remember, We are building assets and quite often that means we're going to have to dilute our value proposition as we grow our portfolio, meaning we might start at a property at $700,000. By the time we do our fifth property because of buying power and lending, we're going to have to work out how to mathematically squeeze in maybe our fifth property at $400,000. So our entire portfolio needs to have a value which is in line with our end game of living off cash flow, which for today's show is $3,000 a week in the back pocket. We want $3,000 a week. So we want to move our money to good cities uh, and the best ones in my view, global cities like Sydney, Melbourne, Auckland, New world cities like Brisbane and Perth, primate cities like Hobart, Adelaide, Gold Coast, Newcastle, uh, which is a feeder city, Toowoomba is a feeder city, Wollongong a feeder city. Now, we wouldn't rush out, for example, to Toowoomba and buy our first asset. We would buy our third or second or fourth asset, depending on our buying power. Our first asset, we want to put in a major area like a Sydney, a Melbourne, or a uh, Brisbane. And we want to do that with A grade potential. We don't want to be in the worst area of those cities. Total opposite. We want to be in some of the best performing capital growth suburbs that we can. Remember, we do have choices as property investors, and too many people rush out to regional dying town centres, where really, if something was to go wrong in the industries in those areas, those industries get affected, that whole town gets affected. You know, I've seen towns literally 
drop so enormously in value because of their uh, jobs, what people do in those towns. So would I rush out to Coffs Harbour, the big banana? Is the big banana worth investing in in Coffs Harbour? Well, for me, no, because even though Coffs Harbour might be having a great year in real estate, the long-term trajectory of jobs in Coffs Harbour, which is famous for the big banana, is not exciting to me. Is there more prospect of A-grade people being in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane? Absolutely. Same concept in New Zealand, by the way. I've got a lot of Kiwi listeners. You know, you might want to move your money to Auckland, then Wellington, then Christchurch, Hamilton, Tauranga, before you go out to Pukahoe. Who wants to live in Pukahoe? Probably no one, right? So we got to understand real estate and the value of it only matters three times. The day you buy, the day you refinance, and the day you sell. And here's where most property investors go wrong building a portfolio. They buy with the value of the day they buy, but they have no comprehension of the when will refinancing occur and what will the appeal of that property be should I need to sell. This is where in real estate we have kind of like two worlds. We have the liquid real estate world and the e-liquid real estate world. What you do not want to end up with when building a property portfolio and your defensive assets is e-liquid real estate. E-liquid real estate is measured by days on market. E-liquid real estate means your asset cannot be shifted in an appropriate time period. A real estate agent cannot list it and sell it after four or five real estate open homes. Your illiquid real estate cannot go to the auction market and clear. No one will buy it. And what we often find is illiquid real estate, days on market can be like 120 days, 160 days. Really all that is telling us is there is no demand for those areas. Illiquid real estate is typically found in regional small towns, small uh, communities and really dying communities. It's also found in really the wrong asset choice. Uh, Real estate, which for example has no functionality or design, quite often can be illiquid. However, what we do find is even if you typically buy a B or C or D grade property in Melbourne, it's probably going to sell. If you do the same in Sydney, it's probably going to sell on the weekend, regardless of uh, how flawed your asset is. In other words, the bigger the market, the more forgiving it is to you as a property investor. So remember, Australia is growing and I love looking at the population clock, same in New Zealand. Every, uh, literally one minute and 43 seconds in Australia, there is a new baby born, little baby. We've always got the New Year's baby. Who's going to be the first one out of the oven for New Year's? Well, I'll tell you what, where we're at at the moment with the stall in population is Australia is growing every four minutes and 38 seconds by a new person, either by uh, birth or by migration. Every four minutes and 38 seconds. So you can imagine we need a new property very quickly. If you've got a new person every four minutes and 38 seconds, that means you've got to produce real estate. The average real estate around Australia uh, takes ages to develop. So quite often this population clock often has a direct impact on bigger areas which are harder to develop. Sydney is actually a lot harder to put more stock in than a small regional community. Melbourne is a lot harder. There's a lot of planning. Brisbane, a lot harder, a lot of planning. So Once you've decided that you're going to invest and you've mapped out what you want to achieve, you've got to then obviously have a budget and start building assets. Once you've 
acquired some assets, you've obviously got to give it time, time to grow, time to uh, perform for you. But what we want to do is start with defensive growth assets. And if we buy well, we will be able to extract equity. And we can use that equity if we can service more debt to buy another property. In other words, our first property may actually give birth to a second property and eventually a third property. Now, why I call this the five cities, five properties plan is quite often you might give birth from your defensive asset from, say, your investment in Melbourne. And then all of a sudden, you can't really afford a really good location in Melbourne because your second asset is going to quite often be something which is not as good as your first asset. So that means maybe just for you, you need to branch out and choose a new city where you can get, again, that A-grade real estate. So if you can imagine we're building an Australian portfolio and we're just imagining right now, we might choose A-grade Sydney, then move to A-grade Melbourne, then move to A-grade Brisbane, then move to A-grade Perth, then move to A-grade Canberra or Adelaide, and we've built a really good portfolio using the value proposition, which naturally occurs across our different cities, Sydney being the alpha, all the way down to our fifth or sixth price version of a great city. And that might be a feeder city. Quite often, uh, when I've built portfolios for people, I've had to go to Geelong and I've had to go to Newcastle and Wollongong to support asset building. I've had to go to Toowoomba to pick up that fourth asset, which uh, good part of Toowoomba is a lot better than a bad part of, for example, Brisbane. So we've got to really start to map out how we can mathematically build this portfolio. The big number to end up on $150,000 passive income which is around $3,000 a week. That's the goal. That's the New Year's resolution. Want to end up on $3,000 a week. We're going to have to own around $3 million worth of assets. And so those assets need to be growth assets. And of course, when you think about the population and tax dollars spent, we know that cities are the best place for that. We know that the globe is pushing for 8.3 billion people by 2030. I can tell you that the average age of a person on earth will be around 34 years of age, meaning by 2030, millennials and Zs are going to be young, they're going to be hungry, they're going to bring with them ideas to grow the world, but also that means there's a huge marketplace behind us right now, which is going to want real estate. I can tell you that really the world is moving to cities. 62% of people by 2030 will live in cities. There is really no such thing as a rich rural nation. Today, rich people and rich nations have cities. So, there is an absolute tsunami of people about to invest. This is something which I think is so important to understand. Australia and New Zealand will not have zombie economics. In other words, we do not have a dying or aging population. We have a huge young millennial group which is going to take on the burden of more debt, more growth, more uh, everything. And that wave seems quite small compared to that of our Asian counterparts. Around 2 billion middle class people will be millennials by 2030. That is just absolutely crazy. Around the globe, around 2 billion millennials. So you can imagine the amount of worth, work, uh, and worth coming out of those people. So I'm a big believer that cities are going to have great job growth. 
and new jobs which we haven't even heard of today. And one of the things that I think is very interesting about economics is people today will have several jobs and a lot of that won't be via their own liking. In other words, people will need to constantly reskill to be part of the macroeconomic plan of the future. Now, to build the five cities, five properties plan to end up on three hundred. Uh, th- oh, sorry, $3,000 a week, $300,000 a week would be great, $3,000 a week, you're going to have to understand finance. And a lot of people don't really have a good relationship with finance. They don't understand it. But I'm here to tell you in Australia, there are 145 different loan types you can get. And borrowing money off Westpac might mean you can you know, afford a $500,000 property but borrowing off CBA might mean you're able to afford a $600,000 property. What does that actually mean for you? Well, it actually means you can buy a better suburb. It means potentially you can get better growth. It means potentially a better class of tenant. So a big part of understanding building an asset base is understanding finance. And this is where a really solid broker can really help you. And I'm doing this at the moment. You know, I'm helping a young couple, their siblings, brother and sister. And one of the challenges we have is once we buy a property, their serviceability is going to drop. So even if they made equity, they potentially cannot buy another property again. So they've already maxed out. So their journey is going to be a little bit different. They can buy an asset. Then we've got to go and help them build a new deposit, a new cash deposit, and also increase their wage so that they can eventually build their assets. So it's not easy, but it can be done. And there are some critical pillars to build assets. First of all, you need a plan. And today I'm giving you the plan. I'm trying to convey it to you as best as possible over a podcast. You've got to sort out you, whether that means you've got to go and get a wage increase, get a second job, get an ABN and start a side hustle business. All of these things matter to building a portfolio. You can't just buy a property and it pops out another one and another one and another one. At some point, there is you involved. You have to be financial. You have to increase your ability to earn income. That, my friends, often takes you to commit to getting a better job, earning a bigger pay rise, not being comfortable in the business you're at just because people are nice because the reality is if you can earn more money somewhere else, it's going to allow you to grow your asset base. Finances can help and obviously there is the market and property selection which is a big part of the puzzle. But today we're just talking about the overall mud map here, the overall plan. We're not going to drill down into too much specifics about which property is going to make you money and which one's not. Now as part of this plan I love teaching the Forex growth plan, which as you know, there are four types of ways to create growth in real estate. Why this plan is important is if you want to extract equity out of one property, you need to do that in a period of time. And I always teach there's growth in buying well, there's growth in location, there's growth in the market cycle if it's rising or falling. And there's growth in behavioral economics, what people really want. And to measure that success, if you buy a property today, we often look for what is known as cash on cash return. In other words, how quickly can you pull out a deposit that you've put into a deal? So let's say there's a property for $500,000, you put a 10% deposit down, that's $50,000. And all of a sudden, you can pull that 50 grand out on completion in the form of cash. You've got a very good cash on cash return deal. If that happened over, say, 12 or 24 months, 
That means you're recycling your deposit quite quickly. Uh, 12 months, uh, money in and out is considered 100% cash on cash return. Now, there are ways to speed that up and I help clients always work out ways to speed it up. I'm doing a deal next week where I'm making the vendor pay a cash deposit. Yes, the vendor. In other words, the cash on cash return is actually incredibly high. It's almost impossible to measure because the vendor is paying the deposit on behalf of the buyer. Why would a vendor do that? Well, we look for what is known as the six Ds, distress, divorce, the bank or the bank and a few other elements, right? I won't go through the six Ds right now. It's a conversation for another day. But we also need to understand, so we're going to buy well, we're going to choose a good location, and if the market is really helpful, we might even be able to crack on and pull even more equity out. That is the basis of portfolio building. You leapfrog from one asset to the next asset to the next asset. And if I was just to give you a broad example using the median value of Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, Brisbane and Adelaide, we can build a portfolio. So the median value of Sydney is about a million bucks, Melbourne about 750, Perth about 450, Brisbane about 530 and Adelaide about 465. All of that adds up to just over $3 million. So you can imagine we want a number at the end of doing this asset building. We want growth, but we also want income. Now, measured at 5%, a $3 million portfolio will throw out around $150,000 cash flow. $150,000 cash flow is three grand a week. Remember, the purpose of what I'm trying to teach you is to have a plan that actually allows you to end up on income. Now, assuming we were able to acquire those $3 million worth of real estate, and it doesn't have to be $3 million, uh, it could be $2 million, it could be $1 million. Your number may not be $150,000 passive income. Your number might be $50,000 passive income, which is fantastic when you add that to your superannuation and some other benefits you might be able to get in life. So you might only need a million dollars worth of real estate. It all depends on what you want, how much you want to spend later, and how hard you want to go on this. But remember, if you were to acquire $3 million worth of assets over the next five to 10 years, and then you give it another 10 to 20 years worth of time to grow, you're actually going to put yourself in a position where more than likely your real estate will double. So the $3 million worth of assets you've bought over the acquisition phase of accumulating assets for your backbone may actually double in value. And what does this allow you to do? By watching this real estate double in value, You've not only built assets, you've kept wealth and of course you can sell some down to pay off debt and live debt free and also have an income from the yield from the real estate. But also watching the real estate over time increase in value will give you the opportunity to do other things. As I alluded to at the start of this conversation, those other things might be passive income annuity assets or speculation annuity assets. For me, as a wealth builder, I've been through buying capital growth backbone assets. I've got more growth than I can poke a stick at. I don't need growth. I now need the idea of speculative returns. I now need the idea of passive annuity returns. For me, uh, I could go out and buy growth assets, but it uh, isn't necessarily going to dramatically change my life. It would be great if they grew, but I've now gone into a completely new phase where I can take more risks, I can get more reward, I don't have to wait 20 years for growth to occur to get results from assets. 
And the reason is simply I put the work in. So one of the big takeaway value bombs I want from this conversation is that you go and put the work in. You start with understanding your critical pillars that you need to work on, your plan, you, your finances, understanding real estate marketplaces, and then eventually property selection. And of course, this can be applied in New Zealand. Now, how would a five cities, five property plan look like today? Based on 2020, the capital growth rates of 2020. Let's assume we owned a property in Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane, Melbourne, and Sydney. The annualized capital growth of Sydney has gone up 7.7%. So the real estate you would own in real estate has gone up 7.7%. So uh, the average you know, real estate in Sydney is a million dollars. So 7.7% of that is what? $77,000. So you see what's going up on here, the compounding effect of having your assets in different marketplaces really allows for growth, but it also allows for diversification. 2021 is going to be a pretty unusual year. There's going to be a lot of growth in most marketplaces. Melbourne, Sydney, Perth, Brisbane will all have a really good growth run. And a lot of that is fueled um, by essentially uh, low rates, right? We're in the sort of new transformation of low rates and the ease of credit. And the same in New Zealand, you'll find a lot of the cities grapple with growth over there as well as uh, government sort of starts to sort of think about, well, do we restrict growth? Is it going to be too unaffordable into the future? But for the most part now, there is a bit of a steam engine brewing and it's allowing for capital growth to happen in most cities. Back to 2020 in Australia, if you had bought in Melbourne, despite the stage four lockdown, you would have had 3.1% growth. Remember, this year there's been really no inflation. Uh, Brisbane, around 3.8%, and Adelaide, around 3.6%. But you would have lost in Perth, going backwards by 1%. But let's fast forward to 2021, same portfolio. The forecast for Brisbane, 2021, according to ANZ Bank, is 9.5% growth. Perth, 12% growth. So all of a sudden, you can imagine this $3 million portfolio with a spread across marketplaces is performing. Your Perth asset could go up 12%. Your uh, Brisbane asset will go up 9.5% according to the forecast. And as we know, when marketplaces tend to go up by 10% or more, generally the following year is the same. And the reason is people start to get a lot of FOMO. So we know if you can start building your assets now, the likelihood of you getting more and more assets is very strong. And actually, when it comes to asset building, there are times where it's a lot harder and a lot easier. Right now, I would say we're about to go into a period where it is a little bit easier in Australia. In other words, easier credit, um, less regulation, and the ability for people to buy more assets. Conversely, back in 2017, when APRA put a speed limit on lending, it was a lot harder to create more and more assets. So don't miss the opportunity to asset build. And one of the reasons I want this to be one of your New Year's resolutions, by 2025, asset building might slow up. And what I mean by that is at some point, austerity or the slowdown of economics will occur uh, and debt will need to be paid back. And I would imagine by my forecast, after the next election, things will really invert on government spending. At the moment, the government runs the economy. They're spending as much as possible. They are trying to put the economy back in the hands of business. And by 2024, they will do that. But then government will stop spending and start paying off debt. When there is an austerity period, it's a lot harder to asset build. So as a potential or investor right now, you want to do everything you possibly can to get back into the real estate marketplace. If that means finding a second job, do it. Even if it was for three years and you built three assets and then stopped 
doing that second job, it will be incredibly valuable for the rest of your life. Just a little bit of pain will give you so much opportunity. And, you know, remember, work hard now for an easy life later. Don't have an easy life now because you'll end up having a hard life later. And what I want you to walk away with from this podcast is think about the underlying asset. Don't go and buy the weird creepy poppy. Don't go and buy the property which does not mirror future economics. Future economics is congestion. So be a contrarian and bet on mobility. Future economics is environmental impacts to the world. So don't bet on a suburb or an area which is riddled with environmental problems. Bet on a suburb which is a wellness area or is considered bulletproof and sustainable by virtue of its, uh, its flora and fauna. Uh, think about things like being a contrarian when it comes to functionality. There are so many dysfunctional properties and all of a sudden functionality makes a difference. In Victoria, they're introducing a scheme to make all real estate thermally efficient. Again, this is something I've been betting on for a while. Rather than just buy any old property which doesn't have a thermal rating, I've been buying real estate as a contrarian which has had a thermal rating. Why? Because the underlying asset is so important to the future gain of your wealth. So you want to make sure that your asset is mirroring future economics. So the big part of the puzzle is to end up with a backbone of real estate. Once you have a backbone of real estate, you can accelerate. And this is where investing becomes so amazing. You really do leave the uh, part-time investment arena and you can really do so much more investing. When you've got uh, your five properties which have gone on to double in value and you're a multi-millionaire, you can start to do as much as you want or as little as you want. It's completely up to you. You will have choices in life and I think that is the best thing you can uh, ask for when it comes to a New Year's resolution. I tell you what, I hope you have a cracking New Year's. I hope you get to pash or snog someone you love. You take care, have a ripper one, and I will catch you on the next episode of The Urban Property Investor. Thanks for tuning in to The Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of The Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.